What is going on, everybody? Roma the Roma here. Tonight we're going to break down some really good, uh, really good techniques to to actually scale your Amazon business. Go ahead and comment below where you're from, where you guys coming in from. I'll let you know if there's any books there. We got Rake and Profit in the house watching watching my YouTube video. I can hear him in another room. So yeah, this is a this is a really important concept, guys. This is something that I've realized from really traveling across America and going to six and seven figure Amazon sellers operations and just kind of putting pieces to the puzzle together. What are these guys doing differently than the people that are trying this and they're just part time? The people that aren't successful with it. And you guys know my approach to business is just dive in heads for head first. And over the last couple of years, I have learned so much about this business and I would be an idiot if I didn't notice these certain trends. And I'm, I'm going to get into the number one trend that I've noticed among all of these uh, different uh, mentors of mine, if you could call them that. Uh, some of them work on work with me one on one other other some of these other people, I just I've kind of looked at them from from afar and I've been like, okay, this is this is what they're doing. This is how they're making all this money. We got UK in the house. We got a lot of people from UK trying to get in the book game. I'm sure there's lots of expensive books over here. Who else we got in the house? Where are you guys coming from? Smash that like button. Go ahead and uh, lightly tap that like like button if you guys are entering. Um, that'll really help out. The other night when everybody smashed that like button, my YouTube video went uh, did pretty well. It went from usually my YouTube videos get you know a couple hundred views in the first few days, but that one's over a thousand right now. So if you guys hit that like button, YouTube's gonna deem that this video is a good video. We got ten people in here right now, so I'm gonna dive into this, guys. All right, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Are you guys digging these PowerPoint type videos? Let me know. All right. So most booksellers will never master this. And this is just because... I think a lot of booksellers out there just lack uh, business savvy and they just lack business experience. It's probably a better term for it. Um, but it, it, it's more than just hustle. It's more than just delegation. It's more than just implementing uh, business advice, general business advice to this business. And um, it's about being smart. It's about really... Uh, knowing your numbers. That's what thats what this ultimately comes down to. So I'm going to tell you what separates part-time Amazon sellers from full-time Amazon sellers. And I'm also going to tell you how. So I'm, I'm going to tell you what this thing is, but then I'm also going to break down how you can take action on my advice. So I've had the privilege to travel America and visit six to seven figure booksellers. I've literally gone to their operations, seen what they're doing, had conversations with them. Caleb Roth is one of my mentors. He's a seven-figure bookseller. I have a couple mentors in the Northeast. I got a mentor in Texas. I've gone to these guys' operations and I've seen what they're doing and they all have one thing in common. And that is finding good sources. Now, when it comes to finding good sources, I mean good sources. I mean sources that actually allow you to build a business because some people uh, they get all excited about the book business and they try scaling, but their sources aren't good enough uh, to allow for a healthy business, a business that can survive uh, during a time like this. You know, when 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 shit hits the fan, is your business going to be able to thrive? And one thing I've noticed about uh, different businesses, uh, especially like large businesses that that have huge profit margins. Book, books have great profit margins. Um, I don't know compared to many businesses because honestly, I'm a baby in the business world. But Bill Gates says that he wants his company to be able to provide for his employees for two years. If, if they got no profit for two years, 
he would be able to pay for his employees. So if you don't have profitable sources, if your sources aren't good, and I'll go over what makes a good source in a second, you are not going to be able to run a business because what happens when, when your source shuts down or someone else claims your source or your source is no longer good because we're in a time like this and you have to let everybody go in your business. And if you're a one man army, if you're a sole proprietor, uh, or maybe you're doing this as a side hustle, that means you're done. That means you have to fire yourself and step down and go back to your corporate nine to five and start working there again. So it's important to have a source that allows you to make healthy enough profit to set it aside, really stack that bank account up, get that bank account big enough to where if a crisis does happen, which it will, it's inevitable. Um, whenever, whenever it's sunshine, whenever the sun's out, the storm's coming. It's just a matter of time. Hurricane season's coming to Miami pretty soon. And that's expected. It comes every single year. But there's also three to four months of the year where it's beautiful. So just expect that to happen, guys. It's, it's going to happen. And make sure you have good sources in place. So when it does happen, you have enough money in your bank account. Side note, what would you guys do if you had a business that was profitable enough to really allow you to survive for at least six months and just pay, pay your employees, pay yourself for six months and generate no profit. What if you had a business that had that much money in the bank account? How would that change your life? What things would you be doing differently? Would it, would it be freedom? Would it be travel? Would it be, I really want you to visualize this because this is a big part of being successful. What would you do differently in your life? How would your day to day look different? Comment one thing, how your life would look different below. I'm, I'm really curious because I know for me, it's travel. That's my biggest thing. You guys will, will notice a correlation between how successful my business is and how much I travel because that is one of my biggest values right now. And I know that as I get older, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to travel. But I do want my, I want my family to be able to travel as well. That's also really important for me. So yeah, I talk a lot about delegation. But the truth is you won't be able to delegate for long if you're not profitable. So it's super important to be profitable in business. So the key to finding home run sources is to go upstream. One of my mentors, I'll call him my mentor, even though he's dead. I've never met him. I've just listened to his YouTube videos. His name is Jim Rohn. Go check him out if you haven't already. He talks about the people in business. The people in business that make the most money are the people that provide the most value. So the more value you provide in business, the more money you're going to make. This is about going upstream, guys. Reselling in and of itself is looked at as a... Uh, almost like a leech type of business. Like you are a leech. You are taking things where people don't know the value of them and you're reselling them on the internet for more. So you're stealing. A lot of people look at it as like stealing or whatever. But what you'll realize is like the lowest tier resellers, the ones that make the least amount of money, uh, they don't provide any value to anyone except the market because reselling provides value to the market because you're taking something and you're selling it to someone else, that in and of, in and of itself is value because you're, you're buying from one merchant and providing an item for another merchant. Smallest amount of value you can provide as a reseller. Uh, once you begin to provide more value, uh, you almost become more of a service uh, than a product-based business. So we start out as a product-based business, we have books, but to really scale, uh, from, from my experience, this is really from my experience. I found it, it turns into a service-based business. You are now being a service for a bunch of different people, a bunch of different sources, and you're providing value to them in different ways. And I'll go over that uh, in a second, actually right now. So yeah, provide value for the other parties. So thrift stores and libraries are a great way to start sourcing books. You can literally make over a thousand dollars at a library sale on the weekend I've, I've made more than that. I've made about $1,000 in a Goodwill before. I've gone into a Goodwill in a very rich town in Arizona, Havasu City. I'll go ahead and put that out there. If you guys are in Arizona, go to Havasu City for the weekend. I absolutely cleared out that Goodwill. I don't know if it's recovered yet, but this is a great way. Uh, if you guys are starting out, 100% the best way to start is go to thrift stores, libraries, and just get the ball rolling, get as many books as you can, and really hustle. This is a whole Gary V hustle thing. Go into the thrift stores, scan, 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 get as many profitable books as possible, set them aside, uh, 
list them on Amazon and get some money, get some tangible assets, get some, get some money in your bank account. And then you can pursue these next models I'm talking about. Or if you're someone watching my video and you have some money set aside and you're ready to get this going, or maybe you even have past business experience, um, these other techniques are going to be good. So if you're scanning the same books as everyone else, there's a very low barrier to entry for your business model. As soon as someone, as soon as someone watches one of my YouTube videos or one of my roommate rake and profits, YouTube videos, and they see how to sell books on Amazon, we teach them, you know, basically how to get started. There's going to be people in your living room, wherever you're sourcing your books at libraries, thrift stores, there's going to be people literally, <laughs> this is a crazy business model because what other business model just, it's like, you're like a crab at the bottom of a barrel. There's literally other people in there. And like one day you were killing it. You were making, every time you went to that source, you made 500 bucks. All of a sudden there's five more people in there. Now that source is a hundred dollar source for you. Plus you probably have high blood pressure by the time you left because you're so stressed out scanning everything and trying to compete with people that uh, it just really wears down on you. Trust me, I've been there. So that's the lowest barrier to entry, uh, which means it's the easiest for you to get started right now. And you can make, you can make, you could probably, if you really hustle, you could probably make six figures with that hustle. Uh, but if you really want to get in the six figure, seven figure range, seven, like six figure profit, uh, what you're going to want to do is pursue these business models that have a larger barrier to entry. So pursue business models with barrier to entries. Here are great examples of bar uh, businesses with barriers to entry in the book world. Uh, everybody knows bulk. Everybody aspires for bulk. And I think the reason why people aspire for bulk is it's great. Uh, it, it, it so like, I wouldn't say it's sexy, but it's, uh, it, it makes it look like you made it because now you have forklifts, you have pallet jacks, you have a warehouse, but really what that is on the profit and loss statement is just a lot of expenses. Uh, so bulk is great because it's a replenishable source and the barrier to entry is actually kind of large. Anybody can buy Gaylords, but not everybody can buy Gaylords or uh, pallet of books. Not everybody can buy pallets of books and be consistently profitable um, because they, they just, they don't have these systems in place yet. They don't have the equipment uh, some people will literally go 15,000, 20,000 in debt um, starting bulk. And it, it's just because they're not set up for it. Now, if you're already set up for it, maybe you're a wholesale guy watching my channel and you want you, you found out that the ROI on books is insane. You can make a thousand percent ROI on some books. And maybe you just want to add this to your business model. You're just getting into the book industry, trying to learn more about this. That would be great for you because you already have it set up. You've already... Um, broken down that barrier to entry because you already have the know-how of, of how to really operate a warehouse and you already have the equipment in place. So it's no extra cost for you, but for someone starting out, uh, they're going to be much more profitable, uh, doing cherry picking, just going to thrift stores, libraries, um, all these other models I'll talk about. I, I'm harping a lot on Facebook marketplace, uh, recently, but you can really get close to six figures a year online arbitrage. You can make six figures a year from your laptop sitting at home. Bulk is a different kind of beast. And I, I have mentors of mine that do 3 million a year with bulk, but it's because they have their systems in place. So I'm giving the advice for people that want to get into bulk. You can scroll through my YouTube videos and look back, you know, like a year ago, I tried doing bulk, but I didn't have my systems in place for it. That's why I pursued consignment instead. Because for me to get a pallet of books, it was much less profitable uh, per hour than someone who already had all these pallet jacks, uh, forklifts, space, um, everything in place. So keep that in mind. Barrier to entry with bulk is all this equipment and space and even uh, a way to get rid of duds because sometimes you have to pay to get rid of all those books. Once you have all those books on your hands, uh, you got to get rid of them somehow. You were so happy to get the books and now you have all the books. How do you get rid of them? A lot of times you have to pay to get rid of the books and it can be, you can, you can end up paying three, three or four cents a pound just to get rid of them. Backroom access. So this is uh, the barrier to entry with this one is opening your mouth. 
in an effective way, which is easier said than done. But when you go to wherever you're getting books, libraries, thrift stores, college campuses, college campuses, by the way, a lot of people don't talk about this. College campuses, great place to go and work on your social skills and get very profitable books. Knock on professors' doors. Be the weirdo that does that. You might get kicked off campus. That's when it you're going to have to use these techniques I'm talking about. About to get, get into branding and the importance of branding and the importance of credibility and perception in business. Because I feel like this is something the reselling community, the book selling community uh, needs more of because they're so used to just taking an item and selling it and not really thinking about um, building uh, the build, like building the marketing side of your business, building a business that actually markets itself. And even when you walk in somewhere, what kind of clothes are you wearing? How are you talking? All these things are very important. And so if you can get backroom access at 10, 20 stores in your city and you can own those city, you can own that city, have every manager, have every owner's uh, number on, on hand. They'll call you whenever they get a new load of books. That is very, very, very profitable and that's something everybody starting out should be doing. And even people already in the business should be doing this as well. Um, okay, here we go. This is my favorite. Backroom access plus they scan for you. Um, to do this, you must be uh, the Mark Twain type. Side note, I got my personality tested the other day and I have the same personality type as Mark Twain. So here's a story about Mark Twain. You guys know that he is... Uh, He's got that famous story where he's painting, he's painting the fence and I forget the name of the, his, his character in that story, but he's painting a white fence and he convinces everybody else to paint the fence as well. He doesn't just convince them to paint the fence for free. He makes them pay him to paint the fence. So he had a job for somebody. He had to paint this white fence for this landowner or whatever, and he was getting paid for the job. Anybody in the right mind would try to get their friends and pay their friends he made his friends pay him because he changed the perception of changing of painting the white fence. He made it so much fun to paint that white fence that everybody wanted to do it. His friends were like, yo, like, do you have any more paintbrushes? And he was like, I'm actually out. Like we got five, five of my other friends are doing this right now and they're paying me each five an hour. So if you want to pay seven an hour, I can go grab that paintbrush from him. You guys got to be thinking that way. So um, in order to do this, you have to still use real rules in life. You still have to provide value. You still have to uh, point out the good things about your business. And the good things about your business is you clear up space for people. You clear up space for thrift stores. You clear up, you give them more money. So if they scan the books for you and they're setting them aside, literally they, they get the books in, they scan the books for you, they set them aside. You're providing them massive amounts of value because they're getting more money because they're able to get rid of, not get rid of, but move their profitable books before they even get on the shelves. The most profitable inventory before it even touches the shelves, they've already pulled it all out. So it's all about framing and making it uh, a desire, desirable outcome for them. Uh, so work on your framing, guys, uh, very important. Uh, the, read the 22 immutable laws of marketing. This is going to be important if you guys are serious about building an actual book business. It's going to be more than just scanning books and uh, going to thrift stores. Uh, you, you, to really build a book business, you're going to have to eventually build a brand, which is the whole consignment thing. If you guys didn't know, uh, the heart of my business now is uh, restrictedinventory.com, which I've built a massive brand around. Check this out. Grind hard, well done, sir. And welcome to the freaking well show. I'm providing massive value for the reselling community by selling their books for them at a 50-50 split net profits. Uh, I sell popular textbooks, CDs, and DVDs. And I'm not even pitching you guys right now. Ironically, I kind of am pitching you guys, but I'm showing you guys that this, I'm like breaking down the fourth wall. Uh, if you guys, any actors out there will know what I'm talking about. I'm addressing the audience. You guys are my customers as well. People that use restrictiveinventory.com. Thank you very much. But look what I'm doing here. Visit my website. Look at the credibility I'm building. I'm building credibility for myself as soon as you enter my website. I have testimonials there. I am building trust. I'm letting you know, hey, trust me. So if you guys are going to pursue a similar consignment model, uh, I think uh, take notes, guys. Like One of the things I, I think 
building a successful book business in terms of uh, not wanting to blow your brains out um, and not having a thousand people to deal with like me uh, is pursuing colleges. Uh, the, the thrift stores and libraries, you could pursue those for consignment. But I think if you pursue colleges for consignment uh, and work with their dead stock in the bookstore, I think that's a huge opportunity. So that's, uh, you guys should be writing that note down and just maybe take a look at your city see how many colleges you have around you, see how many universities you have around you. Think about how could I create a brand that works with colleges to sell their library books and their uh, college campus store books uh, for, for more profit for them. How could I provide value? What could I do for them? How can I build a brand that makes them look at me as credible? Get a website, get a Facebook page, get some testimonials, say, Hey, look, I worked with X, Y, Z. Cause then when you start working with three colleges, they're all going to talk to each other and boom, I think someone could really make a uh, decent business, just 10 or 20 schools they work with and they provide that consignment service for them. I, I think that could be huge. Keep in mind, guys, I throw so many ideas out there. Um, and when I say a good idea, like write it down because I can't, I can't go after every idea. Like I have my ideas. I have three projects I'm pursuing right now. And there's so many other things that I could pursue, but I just pursue the ones that I think are best for me in my skill set, which is a big point of this whole PowerPoint is uh, look at all these models and, and pursue the ones that you already are kind of good at. You have a strength uh, in whatever model I'm talking about. This is why salespeople get paid so much, guys. Salesmen, a lot of people look at salesmen like, oh, all they're doing is talking all day. Salesmen get paid a lot because they convince people of things. So you can have a great business idea. You can even make a great uh, looking brand. But if you can't convince people of things, it's going to be really tough. So uh, work on work on understanding what makes people do things. Uh, another good book to read is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. That'll be good for your uh, networking, for for building relationships, and that's 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 key to business as well. Uh, so yeah, another one is college buyback, uh, which which is great. You can make you, you go to college for a day, you set a table up, you sit down, and you purchase books from students with with cash. So you bring cash, you purchase books from students. You can make five figures, maybe even more in one day. Um, I think a six figure haul would be a little bit extreme. That may have to be a huge university, but I know five figures that's completely doable. Um, so in order to do this, you're going to have to have a brand. They're going to call You're going to call them up and be like, Hey, I would like to do a college buyback, blah, blah, blah. Like, Who are you? You have to have an answer to that statement. You're going to say, Hey, I run a book company, blah, blah, blah. So I know a lot of you guys are just starting out selling books, but you guys should be thinking this way. Like what different ways can I present myself to actually build a book business that is going to allow me to quit my nine to five building trust that goes hand in hand with credibility. Hey, I work with this college. I've done college buybacks at this college. Like if you guys went to college and graduated college, call your alma mater up and be like, Hey, look, assholes. I paid you all this money. Let me come and provide some value for you. I'll go to your school and um, I, I'll and ex explain the business model to them. Make a little portfolio and be like, hey, I'll come to, I'll come to the college campus and I'll set up for a day. And um, you're not going to say it like that. I, 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 I screwed that up. But you are, you're going to present yourself as a business and say, hey, I like to actually almost present it as like a fundraiser. Like I have a fundraising opportunity for the school. Uh, I sit down, I provide value to the students by purchasing their books back for them. And 15% of the profits goes to whatever school program really helps me run this. So then you're getting, I wrestled in college. That's why I'm so jacked guys. You guys ever wonder why I have such a nice body? It's because I wrestled in college. That's why. So I get, I get wrestling teams to help me out. I'm like, Hey, look, you know, get some wrestlers to run the table. I'll teach them how to quote books, go watch my YouTube videos and how to quote textbooks. We pay 25% of low merchant offers. And, um, I, I teach them all that BS and then they sit down and they bring cash and, and they pay for the books. So this is just another model. You get 10 schools each semester. That's a pretty good business, a very seasonal business, but that's just, just an idea. Uh, one of my, I wouldn't even call him a mentor of mine, but, uh, one of my acquaintances does this and he does six figures a month. Uh, this isn't his only model, but this is one of them. Uh, local pickups, a system to consistently get leads. 
you need a system to consistently get leads. So local pickups are great, but if you're having five pickups one week and one pickup the next week and zero pickups the next week, that's not very good. You want to say, when someone asks you at Thanksgiving time, you're sitting down with your family like, how's your business going? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, and and someone who is kind of business savvy in your family goes, oh, how many pickups are you doing a week? They kind of get to the core of your business. They're like, okay, they they do books. And the main part of their business is pickups. Uh, How many pickups do you do a week? You got to have an answer for that. Uh, This is something I struggled with earlier this year is not have, not tracking, tracking everything in my business, except for my leads. I wasn't tracking my leads. What are my leads? How many new followers am I getting on Instagram every day? How many new book clients am I getting every day? How many, uh, I did a really good job last year tracking how many books I listed. That's an important metric, but even more important is how are you expanding your book business in terms of uh, serving more people? So local pickups, if you can get 10 pickups a week, 20 pickups a week, whatever it is, you can increase this volume by running ads, creating a Facebook page, get testimonials on that page to build credibility. Again, you can make a website, uh, Matthew Osborne did a great presentation at turn the page. If you guys ever get the chance to go to turn the page conference, we do four every year, comment below, uh, turn the page. And I will give you a link to the next turn the page. I'll make sure to comment that, uh, for you guys. And if a lot of you guys comment, I'll just add it in the bio. Um, but this is a networking event where you get to go and network with other booksellers and they present different ideas like this. And he, was talking about a donation pickup website. So you can literally make a website for your city and now that's leads. You're not working You're not working on hustling, getting all these leads, your website's working for you. And every week you have X number of leads lined up for local pickups. So in order to make this scalable and to fit my criteria, I'm always talking about replenishable sources. It's not replenishable if you have five pickups one week and zero pickups the next. You wanna have a consistent number of pickups every week, that is replenishable. Uh, you can also build relationships with liquidation type companies uh, or just different businesses. Call the liquidation companies up and be like, hey, I would like to provide uh, a service where whenever you guys go to a place that has a lot of books, I'll be the person, you got my number, I'll come and pick up the books. Because a lot of people look at books as trash, they're heavy, nobody wants to read books, this is what a lot of people think, they're not worth anything. So you can be their savior by, you know, they're going in grabbing all the computer equipment and they're like, we don't know what to do with all these textbooks that are worth hundreds, thousands of dollars. We don't know what to do with those. And you're like, oh, I, I, I take those off your hands for you, no charge. And then you go pick up, you go pick them up, you take them and now you got, you got a business. You, you're working on that relationship with them. Donation bins. So there's two different types of donation bins you can do. Uh, one has a bit of a bigger barrier to entry than the other. I actually have a buddy of mine who, who really worked hard with, with network and I won't say his name and I won't say where he is, but he got hundreds of donation bins set up. Uh, the expensive kind that are, that run between 1000 and $2,000. So if you guys type in uh, large donation bins on Google, you should be able to find these websites that sell these brand new for anywhere from probably one to $5,000. Um, but if you, if you get this going guys, and, and you know, if you're someone that has more money, this is a great model to pursue because now you have uh, something that sits there and just gets inventory for you. And the inventory that you get from a donation bin is going to be much better than the inventory you get really anywhere else because it's raw inventory. It's inventory directly from people's houses, hasn't been scanned through by other resellers. So really consider this model. Um, again, this is going to take, this is going to take trust and, and it's going to take relationships with the people who you're setting the do- donation bin up on their property. So you're going to be setting the do- donation bin up on, I don't know, Home Depot's property, whoever, but you do need to again, have business skills where you go and you call these places and say, Hey, look, can I set this donation bin up there? Another lower barrier to entry type of donation bin you guys can do is going to colleges. And this is really important to have a brand again, go in professional, uh, have a website and you don't have to have a website, but it's really nice to have a website. If anything, get a Facebook page at least. Um, again, guys, having a website, is a barrier to entry. It takes time to build a website. So people know intuitively, if you have a website, you're probably a legitimate business. Anyway, you go to the college, you have boxes. Uh, if you can get, you know, your custom business name put on the boxes, even better. And then you set them up around campus 
and they collect textbooks. Textbooks are worth way more and it's much more manageable because now once a week or once a month, you can go through, pick up all these boxes or have someone else do it for you. If you guys follow my advice and get, get, get people to do things in your business that you uh, don't have to do. So you should only be doing things in your business that you can do. So you have someone else go through, pick up all those boxes and boom, you have 50 boxes at your doorstep filled with textbooks. Uh, and it, you didn't have to buy that much equipment. You just had to work on relationships and, uh, and trust. Liquidation deals will come up from time to time. So uh, the barrier to entry with this is the ability to remove everything and ability to travel across America because these are generally few and far between, but they happen all over across America every single day. So your city might not have liquidation deals every day, but somewhere does. So if you're a hustler, like I was Romer the Romer, I was living in my car traveling the country. These were great for me because I would find out, oh, there's, you know, there's a lot of books that someone's trying to get rid of. Someone's auctioning off these books. I'm going to drive to Arkansas tonight after I leave salsa. I'm at my salsa event. I get a notification on my phone. Someone messages me. Hey, there's all these books in Arkansas. Boom. I'm there. Drive all night. Next morning, I would pack up all the books. And the power of FBA is you don't need to have, because uh, I, I did put you have to have the ability to remove everything. But if you're doing FBA, you can generally work on site. And you can even negotiate, hey, could I cherry pick this lot and leave everything else here? And I'll just take the good stuff. I'm just going to take 10% of the books and you can resell all the duds, everything I don't want. Don't call them duds, but you can resell the rest of the books. I'm just going to take the good stuff. You take the good stuff. You're driving a Toyota Corolla. Maybe there's five times as many books that you can fit in your Corolla. What you're going to do is ship those FBA. So now you can pack these books up. Shipping to Amazon warehouse, boom, you drive back to wherever you're from and you just made five figures. I always say five figures because it's, it's, it's enticing. It's going to be nice when you guys get your first five figure deal. That is, uh, you'll be hooked on books forever and we will be very good friends. Yeah, there's, there's many other models. Uh, the, the key is to leverage your strengths. Leverage your strengths, guys. If, if you're a salesperson, leverage that. If you have space, if you have equipment, leverage that. If you have capital, leverage that. If you're smart and you know numbers, maybe online arbitrage is good for you, leverage that. Um, there's a lot of different ways. But something, that, again, the common theme I've realized among all successful booksellers is they found one sourcing technique that works and it's very profitable for them. And generally these techniques, almost all these techniques to an extent have a barrier to entry. Very important to find a model with barrier to entry. Otherwise, someone's going to kick down your front door, go into your space and scan all the books you have because there's no barrier to entry protecting your books from anyone else. So work on those relationships, guys. Work on, work on these different leverage points. So if you guys want an in-depth breakdown of all these advanced sourcing techniques in my course, and in my sourcing scripts, in my sourcing scripts, I actually give you the words to use to convince people to give you their books. Not give, some, some of my scripts will tell you how to give, to get people to give you the books, but a lot of them just convince you that this is a good idea. It's a good idea to go in business with this person. So I know those sourcing scripts are going to make a lot of people money. So if you guys are interested in the book business blueprint, my new course, the link is in the description below, or you can go to bookbizblueprint.com. And also, if you guys are in uh, the Book Business Blueprint, I will be in the Facebook group every day working one on one with you guys. So if you guys have questions, those are my priorities. Uh, of course, if you guys comment questions or message me on Instagram, I will get to those as well. But the Facebook group is my priority. So if you guys are interested, in flipping hundreds, hundreds of profitable books, especially textbooks, the book business blueprint. Click on that. It's below. All right, guys, let's get into some Q&A. Hopefully that provided value for you guys. If that did, uh, go ahead and lightly tap that uh, like button. And I'm going to answer some questions for you guys. What do you guys think of that PowerPoint? You guys digging the PowerPoints? Louie. 
Louis saying, what up? What up, Louis? We got Stone Creek Picker saying, hi, Romer. Stony Creek Picker. Hello from Cali. What is going on, Manny? We got 23 people in here. I love it. Elbow cough. <laughs> did, I, did I elbow cough? Don't judge me for elbow coughing, man. I might, might have coronavirus. I don't know. I don't have coronavirus. I do the Wim Hof breathing method every day. Two things you can do to prevent yourself from getting the coronavirus. Do the Wim Hof breathing method every day. If you guys don't know what that is, type in Wim, W-I-M. It's proven to boost your immune system. Wim Hof breathing method, guided. Type that in on YouTube. Another thing you can do is take vitamin D. There's some crazy statistic out there that people that are deficient in vitamin D, which apparently 70% of America is deficient in vitamin D, are much more likely to get the coronavirus. So make sure you're taking your vitamin D and make sure you're doing the Wim Hof breathing method. Can you uh, can you send products to Amazon now? Yes, you can. Facebook user, you can. Tom Sawyer. Yeah, Tom Sawyer uh, was that Mark Twain story that I was talking about. By the way, been calling Goodwills randomly in LA, Ventura County for reopen status. Had a few automated recordings that are opening Saturday, 23rd. Nice. Just adding value for anyone out there in Cali. That's good news for California. I think they open up in Ohio this weekend. Barbershops are open here in Miami. The world's coming back to life, guys. Psychology of the mind. Good job, Avery. Much love. Facebook coming in with a lot of love. We got a YouTube comment here. YouTube saying learning. Brandon, Helium 10. Just got here as a course up. The course is in the link below. If you're on Facebook, it should also be below. Turn the page, baby. Brandon says, turn the page. Turn the page. Those are great events to go to. Oh, yeah. I told you guys to comment, turn the page. So comment, turn the page, and I will get back to you. I'll uh, give you the link to the next resellers meetup we have. Dennis Lopez coming in with the thumbs up. Always love it when I have uh, Latino people come in here because if you guys did not know, I am a salsa master. Not really, but for white people, I'm pretty good. Been working on my shoulders. You guys see my shoulder games getting strong. Boom, been working on my arms. Quarantine, baby. That's a quarantine life. You you work on your salsa moves by yourself. You don't have a girl to dance with. Haven't danced with a girl in like two months. Going crazy. Here is an idea. Contact the Boy Scouts and have them drop off their boxes when they do food drive. You can tell them. This is a really good idea. I like this already. You will pick them up and give them a donation for uh, initial dropping them off. Yeah, that is great. There's a, there's a lot you can do with groups like that. And groups that are hungry for money are going to be perfect to work with because you're hungry for money. Businesses operate by making money. So what you can do is uh, show them how to make money. Show them how to get books. Get them to scan the books for you. Get them to bring you books. In an exchange, you give them money. Uh, and that will work. Yes, the key is relationships. 100%. 100%, guys. Work on networking. Network, network, network. Look at where I'm at, guys. I'm here in Miami living with one of my mentors. I almost said Kaylee Roth. Ray can profit because I, I network so hard that now I'm living with him. It's kind of weird, but we're learning a lot from each other. And it just shows the power of networking. Every single day, I learn 10 times more than I would have if I lived by myself because I have a mentor next to me. That's huge. And that wouldn't have happened if I didn't network at the turn the page events. I seen him in action. He's a pro at getting backroom access and getting consignments with the ladies. Who is this? Facebook user, who is that? Go ahead and comment your name. I can't see Facebook names right now. That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, great info says Stony Creek Baker. Much love uh, at libraries. Yep. Uh, Vivian is saying hello. Greetings from Helium Ten. What what do your SOPs cover? Great question. So my standard operating procedures. 
cover listing books. I provide the correct words <laughs> to get someone to list books properly. So you can hand this manual to someone, sit next to them, make sure you know how to list books yourself before you just hand this manual to someone. If you're someone watching this and you're just loaded with money, you buy my SOPs, you can try handing them to people. But what I say is my SOP gets them 90% of the way there. My standard operating procedure, you hand it to someone to list books, they go over it. They're 90% good to go. They're going to come back to you with 10% questions, answer those questions. And yeah, they're good to go. So the listing manuals, repricing manuals, how to hire a virtual assistant. I have my team hire for me. So you're going to get the manual for repricing for maximum profit, all my rules on how to reprice that's going to be included. And then you're going to have a manual to hire the virtual assistant. Um, so you don't have to hire the virtual assistant anymore because sometimes the virtual assistant will uh, flake out or they'll quit or they'll have sadly like a tsunami or something crazy will happen their power will go out, they'll have slow internet, and you're gonna have to hire a new virtual assistant. So I have a whole manual that walks you through that step by step. What I recommend doing is get your uh, get your assistant here in America to hire other virtual assistants, or if you're super cheap, get your current virtual assistant to hire other virtual assistants. I like to keep my virtual assistants separated. I like to have certain virtual assistants for certain tasks. So I, I have a virtual assistant for repricing. We're hiring a new virtual assistant for handling emails. I have a virtual assistant for doing other stuff. I used to have my VA uh, pay all my bills and stuff, but now I have my assistant here in America do that. But I might venture back to having them do it because it's so cheap. It's like $1.50 per hour. So we have the listing manual, the repricing manual, how to hire uh, uh, a virtual assistant for repricing. Um, little things, but important things, how to schedule a UPS pickup. It's going to save you time. It's going to save your employees time. And uh, if you schedule smart pickups, you can do that for, you can get free pickups. So that's going to help you out. Just, it teaches, it teaches everything in my business that I'm, I have people do for me is included in the manual section. And if I ever include anything more in my business, I'm going to update the manual section. There's some more that I'm forgetting about. Oh yeah. We teach you how to get ungated a, a to Z. Literally I, I made this manual, not for the course. I made this manual for my, for my team over at restrictedinventory.com. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw this in the screen because I love this song, guys. This is my buddy. Grind hard, well done, sir, and welcome to the freaking well show. It's my buddy from high school. Uh, what was I just saying? I was talking about uh, restricted inventory. Yeah, so getting ungated. We we have a whole manual, and I made this for restrictedinventory.com because we we would get common brand restrictions that weren't like a big deal. They weren't cat. There's so there's two types of restrictions. There's category restrictions. And then there's brand restrictions. We're getting a lot of brand restrictions like Lego we were getting. And, and like this manual teaches you how to get ungated and all that stuff. That's super valuable right there. Uh, I also go over that in the book business blueprint. I teach you how to get ungated. So if you guys don't buy my manuals, th they are separate products. My manuals are separate from the book business blueprint. Just know that guys. But uh, in the book business blueprint, we also teach you how to get ungated. But the manual is really in depth and it, it breaks down the different suppliers you should be using. Um, what else do we break down? Um, there's like two or three other manuals that I just can't think of right now that are included. But, uh, if you email me, I will get those to you or just comment below and I'll make sure to provide everything. Let's see what else we got in here. Junk man is a little bit late today. Junk man's almost always the first comment. Dude, you're slacking today. You got to step it up. Did I have a booger in my nose that whole time? Comment guys. I don't know if I had a booger in my nose. I was, uh, I was just talking. I do these breathing exercises, so who knows? Maybe something came out. You do the 5 o'clock club? I don't know what that is. Sorry. If books don't sell on FBA, should you sell duds as merchant? No. You're going to waste your time. Focus on FBA. That's it. It's incredible leverage. We have um, merchant brings a whole plethora of problems. And I do not recommend adding those problems to your business, especially if you're just starting out. Focus on FBA, focus on getting profitable items in. FBA is so amazing because when you sell books FBA, you are not only having Amazon do everything for you in terms of customer service, fulfilling the order, dealing with returns you're also getting a premium on the price. And if, you're, if your inventory is heavily 
uh, textbooks. If you have a lot of textbooks in your inventory, uh, you're an idiot for doing merchant fulfilled starting out. I know some of my mentors do merchant fulfilled at scale, but they have space. They have the systems in place for that. Textbooks, you'll see $20, $40 increase in price from Prime, from FBA to merchant, which means selling it from your house. So not only are you spending less of your time with customer service returns and actually fulfilling the order, you're also getting paid more. So you're making more money and you're spending less time. It's a win-win. Um, I know some people are going to argue with me. Some people are going to disagree, but I think the time spent, the stress spent uh, building a merchant operation uh, starting out, I, I think you should be 100% FBA. At scale, you can take a step back and say, hey, look, we're passing up on thousands of books every month that we could be making profit on merchant fulfilled. That's when you consider it, but don't consider it until that point. That's just my two cents. Been popping vitamin D like candy. Good. This is my vitamin D t time right now. Am I darker, guys? Is my white ass getting any darker? Also, should I be PG? I, was, I, should, I had this idea. What if, because I, I get, actually get a lot of comments from people that want me to be PG. What if I just said when the video started, I like an intro, like, okay, this video is PG, this video is not. That way, when you're watching this with your kids, you, you're going to know if I'm going to drop F bombs. Um, let me know what you guys think about that. Someone said my hair is so long. Face, Facebook users, man, they, they're getting crazy. Back to the YouTube comments. Uh, is Amazon accepting FBA again this time? Yes. Amazon's accepting FBA shipments. How is turn the page? Turn the page is amazing. Uh, I assume that you want information on turn the page, Facebook user. So I will give you that as well. Someone's saying it's your boy from Rhode Island. So I'm assuming that is Matt. Mark. Mark, sorry, Mark Corbett. Also got a Matt up in that region. Matt's in New Hampshire. I sell vintage books on eBay. Many of your techniques are transferable. Also, Mark Twain books sell fast uh, by far. <laughs> sell best by far. It's good to know. You guys should all get your personality tested. My, my personality, I think it's E N. TP. Uh, and that's, that's the same personality type as, as Mark Twain. Risk taker, uh, visionary. I'm sure a lot of you guys are actually probably similar to me because if you guys are watching this video, you probably have big visions. You probably get so excited over things and like I was just working out uh, and I was just like, I was doing these squats, doing these lunges and I was just like, I'm going to make, I'm going to do all these things. And I was just saying like all these different things I was going to do that were like outside of my uh, comfort zone in terms of like my strengths. I didn't have the strengths for them, but like, I'm like, I'm going to do this software thing or I'm going to do this. And I, I was just like thinking like, it's like, dude, like stay focused, sell your course, sell your books and do that for a year or two. And then add these other things. Cause uh personality type like mine just tries to bring a thousand things in. It's the entrepreneurial uh, personality type. What percentage of stock should one be aiming to sell in one day? Uh, say it is a half percent. So you're going to drive yourself crazy measuring day by day percentage, uh, but I'll go ahead and do it for you. So you should be selling 20% of books each month. So let's, let's do the math here. So 20% each month, that's 5% each week. So five divided by seven is you should be selling uh, 0.7% of your inventory every day. So if you have uh, 2000 in inventory, which is what I recommend everybody get to if they want to uh, survive, <laughs> get to 2000 as fast as possible. And uh, that's not right. 14 books a day. Is that right? Someone check me on that. I think that's right. 14 books a day. If you have 2000 in inventory, you should be selling 14 books a day. So it's kind of nice to have that number in your head, but really you should be measuring how many am I selling this week? 
And also considering different factors, like May, you're going to sell a lot more inventory if you're, if you're heavy textbooks. If you're heavy other products, uh, like more media-based items, CDs, DVDs, Q4 is going to be a lot better for you. Start your day. There's a great podcast. Uh, goes out at 5 a.m. with inspiration. We'll drop you a DM. <clears throat> Much love, Facebook user. Facebook user is providing some value now. Back to YouTube. YouTube saying, Simon from YouTube saying, isn't merchant fulfilled good for high margin, uh, slow moving stock? In theory, yes, but there's always an opportunity cost with everything you do. So you got to think by adding merchant to your operation, uh, what are you missing out on? What sources are you missing out on? How many phone calls to colleges sending college buybacks up could you have gotten? Um, that's just that's my two cents on it. Uh, People get caught up in the weeds with business a lot of times. And they're like, how can I squeeze as much profit out of all these books that I've access to? And I don't think that's the right mindset. I think the right mindset should be, how can I get more profitable books consistently um, that can go through my system, the system that you created to list books, source, like the whole thing we teach you in the book business blueprint, list the books, sort like as simple as possible. We don't, we don't teach you the fastest listing technique. We teach you the listing technique that you can delegate to someone else. And if you have a listing technique where you're adding merchant fulfilled to the operation, I just think you're, you're adding a whole nother layer there. And I think there's a lot more ROI in pursuing uh, other sources. It's my two cents. It's my three cents. Steve Rakin taught me to sell on eBay. You got anything to say about that, Steve? He, he said dot com. He gave you a dot com, Stony Creek picker. Muffin ears. Tell your kids. <laughs> oh, put 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 the earplugs in, kids. Rome of the Romans coming on. <laughs> oh man. Uh, what is the maximum sales rank value you would put into FBA for both USA and the UK market? If a book's going to make me $2,000 and the sales rank is 13 million, I'm going to, I'm going to put it in there. What we do is we, uh, for, for books like that, we set our triggers up in a way to where we'll get notified for things that could be potentially profitable. So I think it's like $50 and up uh, after it's like over 6 million, we get notified. So, Hey, look, our phone tells us our scanning app scout IQ tells us, Hey, this item might be profitable. Uh, and then we look at it. I'm like, Oh, this is a $1,300 book happened to me before I got a $2,000 book. I sold a $2,000 Jewish set. Oh, $2,000 Jewish set. I'm not going to buy this yet. Let me see if it's ever sold. Boom. I zoom out. Oh, it hasn't sold in the last year, according to Keepa. Am I going to quit? No. I zoom out a little bit farther. I teach you guys how I, I have videos for free on YouTube, how to do this. I zoom out a little bit farther. I look at the past three years. Oh, it sold three times in the last three years for $2,000. Am I going to take that book? Absolutely. Am I going to send it in FBA back to the whole workflow thing? Yes, I am because I'm my, my priorities are traveling and I like to travel a lot. And that's why I've built my business the way I have. Uh, we didn't merchant fulfill it. We sent in like a 60 pound set of Jewish books. I actually have a theory that if you, if you send something in that's high rank FBA, that's high value. Uh, Amazon will try and move it faster for you. I have no proof for that at all. It's just a theory. Simon apologizes for asking too many questions. Don't apologize, Simon. Ask as many questions as you want. Brandon is saying, uh, was the test MBTI? I'm not sure. It's the same test that I took to determine my IQ. If you guys didn't know, I'm the smartest bookseller in the community. My IQ, I'm top 16%. 13% of people are in my IQ range. And then there's like a top 1% ahead of me. So if you guys, if you guys want good business book advice, this is a channel to, sub to subscribe to. So hit that subscribe button. I'm just messing around, but I really did get my IQ tested. And uh, yeah, it's up there. 
you know what? Have you guys ever take an IQ test? This is this was literally my mentality going into the IQ test. I took it, and if I felt like I didn't do well, I wasn't going to submit it because I didn't want to. I didn't want to hurt my own ego and bring down my self esteem. So I was like, I felt like I answered every question correctly. So I was like, right, I'm going to submit this and see how I did. <laughs> and uh, that's the only reason why I submitted it. It's twenty bucks. It's like the, and then after that, they got me with the personality test. They got me with a little upsell <laughs> afterwards. Uh, Dennis says, great answer. Thanks. Um, is that new kids math? Is something wrong with my, I calculated that correctly. 20% is divided by 30 was 7%. We, we did the math 5% a week divided by seven is 0.7% each day, 0.7 each day. So Yeah. We, we did it. We done did it. My IQ is high enough to handle that. What's the minimum profit you'll take on an E score of 151? Depends. If I have the book in front of me, I'll send in. If it makes me 50 cents, I'll send it in. If I have to spend a dollar, I'm going to want at least, at least two, realistically, probably three. It's hard for me to leave a book on the shelf when I know I can make $2 off of it. But in the long run, like I have a team that has to list my books. So I should probably leave any book that makes $2 profit on the shelves and just take $3 profit books and up. So uh, yeah, I'd say $2 on an optimistic day. If I'm kind of pissed off. Only $3 books. Avery's pimping the moms. No comment on that. No comment on that one. Uh, how do you zoom out on Keepa uh, with with Scott IQ? So Scott IQ just added that a few months ago. I think you can only zoom out to 12 months. So what I recommend doing, I'm going to show you guys my phone real quick. So if you guys are listening to this, if you guys are having family time with the kids, listening to Romer the Romer, Take a second to look at the screen real quick. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to give you some. I got to clear my browsing history first because I'm showing the kids this. The kids can't see my browsing history. Boom, browsing history cleared. All right. <laughs> Enough with the jokes. This is uh, – got a couple good links in here actually. If you guys ever get suspended on Amazon, hit me up. I have, I have a link to call uh, the health team to get them to call you and – yeah, I don't. I, one of my mentors gave me this link. So if you guys ever get suspended on on Amazon, hit your boy up. I'll, I'll give you that link. Um, but here we go. So look at my screen. You guys see that uh, on this side, Keepa. I bookmark Keepa in my phone. So I recommend doing that on Safari or whatever app you're using. And then uh, whenever you find a book that you're like, oh man, this might be that this might be something and you want to zoom out over several years. All you need to do is go to the Amazon seller app, look up the book. And then from the sell Amazon seller app, uh, what you're going to do is go to, uh, so the add a product page, I'm going to scan a book real quick. I'll be right back guys. Cause I know this would really help some of you guys out. So check this out. So I'm scanning the, the cover and then what I'm doing, if you guys can see here, I'm selecting the product. So let's say you, you look up the Jewish set, you're going to select the Jewish set. So type in the Jewish set, scan the Jewish set, do what you got to do. This is the only way I knew the Jewish set was profitable because it didn't even have English words. So I found it on here and then you're going to go to the list. So this is an old fashioned way of how to list books on Amazon. So you click on list, you go to product details. So after you click on product details, it's going to expose the ASIN. You're going to grab that ASIN. So you can, you can do this all on your phone while you're outsourcing. And this is how I sold that $2,000 Jewish set. I was in the library sale. Nobody was looking at this Jewish set. 
I did that technique I just showed you guys. I literally, I literally, I can't remember if I typed in the Jewish set. Like, here's another trick: if the Jew, if the set, if there's a set of books on the shelf, you can use the Amazon seller app technology to scan the side covers. So I scanned the side covers, and I got uh, a result on here. I think that's how I did it. If I didn't do it that way, then I just typed in whatever word, whatever letters I could. It was like the Talmud set. Then I found the correct one. Uh, sales rank is not a good metric uh, because it was like five or six million or 13 million. It was something super ridiculous high. That's not a good metric. Uh, if I went by sales rank, I probably would have left the Jewish set on the shelf because it was uh, 150 bucks. I had to spend 150 bucks to buy this, but I ended up selling it for $2,000 because I copied this ASIN, opened up Keepa on my phone, and I pay seventeen dollars a month for Keepa. It's worth it if you guys are pursuing any. If you, if you guys are trying to get high demand, high rank books, low demand but super high price books, you guys have to have Keepa. It's seventeen a month, completely worth it. So I looked it up on Keepa, and uh, I I have videos breaking down how to use Keepa. But essentially, I saw whenever it spikes down, it means it had a sale, and I saw that it sold like three times in the past three years, and so I I got it. Shipped it in. There was only like two copies left, and it sold for two thousand dollars. So um, Keepa, Keepa, guys, download that Keepa. Ben Bamboo is asking, is there a? And shout out to Ben. Ben is a member of the Book Business Blueprint. Big shout out, Romer. Is there a book value that, if exceeded, you would only sell on FBM? So I kind of answered that question earlier. I, yeah, I don't do, I don't, I don't have any diff, I, I don't do any FBM. I'll answer this playing devil's advocate for FBM. The people that do FBM, what they'll do is, is they'll say, okay, I can make $3 selling it FBM, which means selling it from your house and shipping it directly to the customer, or I can make $3 selling it FBA which means shipping it to Amazon, having them do all that for you. It's more work doing FBA up front for them if they already have their systems in place. So they're going to do it FBM. They're just going to take that book, throw it on the shelf. It's going to sell. It could sell in 10 minutes. It could sell in 10 days. It's probably going to sell faster than the FBA book. There's data that suggests that FBM books sell two thirds of the time for a listing and FBA books sell one third of the time. Two of my mentors have argued about this. One of my mentors, Caleb Roth, I believe he's right. Everything that man says, I trust. He said he was the two thirds advocate. So that being said, FBM sell more often than FBA. Uh, so where was I going with that? I was talking about why. Yeah. So they put, they put the book on the shelf because it's going to sell quicker. It's going to sell for the same exact profit. So why would they, and they're going to have to do, do, have to do less work. They don't have to label the book. They literally just put it on the shelf and then ship it out. Um, so it's probably the same amount of work actually, but more money for them faster. So that's the, that's the mentality behind uh, FBM and FBA uh, people, people that commingle their operations. Or man, getting the after McDonald's feeling. I don't know what you're commenting on. That's funny. After getting that after McDonald's feeling. Because he's he's eating McDonald's watching my live stream. Uh, does FBA in the United States still split up your inventory into different warehouses? Yes, it does. I did. I got to read this in an English accent because he's from. You said you said from UK, right? I did dabble in it about two years ago, and it was complicated as shipments would would need splitting. Yeah, uh, split shipments suck, man. Split shipments, uh, they're hard to deal with. Our approach to split shipments is, I go over this in detail in the book business blueprint, but man, I'm always going to tell you guys everything, but just know 
the book business blueprint is like my piece of art, something that I've worked on. So I'm very proud of it. Um, but I, I'll break it down for you uh, as simply as I can. So what we do is we we list everything. This is how you combat splits, guys. We, we list everything in one box. I tell my team, when you fill that box up, try to close the shipment. If you can close the shipment and it all goes to one warehouse, we close the shipment and ship, ship it out immediately. If they hit complete shipment on Accelerist and they get three or two or four splits, they continue to list items until they hit at least 150 items. And once they list 150 items, then they hit complete shipment again. And if there's still three splits, Reezy Resells says, I heard this from him. He says that on average, there's three splits. So on average, uh, when, when there are splits, no matter how big your shipment is, 1,200 or 20, there's always three splits. So if you get three splits with a shipment of 20, that's going to be six going to one warehouse, 14 going to another warehouse. And yeah, so that that's already 20. So it'll say 21, a shipment of 21, and then one going to another warehouse. Um, so you, you have three versus if you do a thousand, kind of keep that same ratio. You have 600 going to one warehouse. You have 4,000 going to another. And then let's say you have a hundred going somewhere else. If you, if you, if the whole shipment was 2,100. So now that you have these larger numbers to deal with, you're not getting destroyed by shipping fees. So if you ship one book to an Amazon warehouse, one loan book, you're paying like $2, $3 per pound, which is a complete ripoff. You're losing a lot of money. So to combat this, uh, we call this a box content method. We list hundreds of items at once, and then we go back through and we use box contents to scan everything in and pack them in their respective boxes according to the splits. Whoa, that was boring. Let's move on to the next question. Wow, man, dropping some gold nuggets. Much love. Facebook coming in with more love. YouTube is saying, I don't know what that means. You guys are coming in with, in with some weird shit tonight. Sorry, I just broke the PG. I didn't commit to being PG on this podcast or this uh, live stream, whatever you want to call this. Whatever, whatever, whatever's going on right now. I always say podcast. Is this a podcast, guys? Could I make this a podcast? I could make it a podcast. My virtual assistant might. What podcast platforms do you guys listen to? Because I'm trying to step my podcast game up. Uh, we have Spotify. We're on iTunes now. What a lot. I'm on like six different podcast platforms and I don't even know how to engage with the audiences there. I just know that my audio is extracted from YouTube and it's put on these platforms. So comment whatever uh, podcast platforms you guys use. I use YouTube. I listen to YouTube for podcast. Bim Bamboo is saying thanks. Shout out to my man, Romer. Sorry I missed your answer earlier. Uh, great answers as always. Appreciate the love. We got we got a Facebook user in the house. He's saying, I can see pros and cons for both FBA and FBM, but with books, it's not a quickly, it's not a quickly as, for example, retail arbitrage for toys in fourth quarter, uh, which means some sellers do FBM, yeah. Uh, selling the item as they are buying it. Books take longer time. Yeah, books take about three months to turn. So if you have, if you source books and you're like, oh, I made $1,000 profit on this haul and you spent $200 on it, you're not going to realize your full $1,000 until uh, three months pass. On average, it takes about three months for inventory to sell. If you're sourcing with about, the Scout IQ default uh, sourcing metrics. So if, if you're taking a lot of high rank inventory, it's not good. It means you could you could really be seeing six month turn rates, which is terrible. So keep keep that rank low. Look out for those Jewish set opportunities where they do sell for two thousand dollars, or you find an art book that sells for three hundred. Keep your eyes peeled for that, but don't obsess over monetizing each book. It's going to hurt you more than help you. 
You have the most wonderful English accent. You have the most wonderful English accent. Do I, guys? Coming coming from someone from from England, that means a lot. MJ or LeBron? I already. I feel like this is my friend Terrell from Nashville because he's he's always saying stuff like that. But I'm gonna say uh, MJ. Michael Jordan for sure. Uh, he's a. I just I've heard more stories about his work ethic. And I'm all about the work ethic. I'm sure LeBron works hard as fuck though too. ISTJ is my uh, MBTI results. Oh, okay, he's saying that's his personality type. Uh, came out the same as Warren Buffett. Uh oh. He's Warren Buffett and George Washington. Would you guys rather be Warren Buffett or Mark Twain? That's the real question. I'd probably be, rather be Warren Buffett. I, I did my DNA test too. I got my genes tested and I'm related to Jimmy Buffett somehow. He got his genes tested. I got my genes tested and it showed, it showed that somehow we're related to one another. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. So if you guys don't know who Jimmy Buffett is, he's a country music artist. Love my cassette tapes. As a UK seller, uh, am I subject to sales tax when using FBA? Simon says, as a UK seller, am I subject to sales tax? Um, I would say yes. I want to be safe there. Talk to a CPA. Not from the UK. In America, uh, I think Amazon. Again, I'm not even qualified to answer this question in America. But uh, it's just I hire a CPA for stuff like this. And I focus on my business because I'm just going to stress out over I have 50 states I'm selling in. I'm talking about sales tax in each state. Yeah, my mind's going to explode. But I, I, I think what we do, and I have a whole video where I interviewed my CPA. I'll link that below because that's, that's going to be very valuable for you guys. Check out this video where I, and I interviewed Chris, very smart guy. I met him at a Turn the Page event too. I probably asked him this question. I asked him a question about sales tax and obviously I forgot the answer because it was so boring. <laughs> But I think essentially uh, if Amazon doesn't file it for us, which I'm not sure if they do or not, again, this is a terrible question for me. I think he said something along the lines of it's going to cost more to file for sales tax in certain states. I'm going to end up paying him more to file for me in all these states than getting hit by a couple of their penalty fees. I probably shouldn't be saying that on YouTube, but I think that's what we do. Again, he's a super smart guy. He'll answer tax questions way better than me. Go to that video and uh, check it out. It'll be below after this live stream's up. Thank you so much once again for this live video and taking the time to answer our questions. 100%, Simon. 100%. Someone's saying they would rather be Warren Buffett. All right, guys. That is it for tonight, unless you guys – ask a question in the next 10 seconds. I'm going to end this. Uh, I will show you guys a uh, little, little salsa move one more time. What do you guys think about this? Working on isolating my shoulders, go backwards. For, for a Caucasian, for Caucasian, it's pretty good. If you guys think I'm being racist for saying that, go check out my interview. I'll also link this interview below. If you guys are dancers or if you guys are interested in like evolutionary uh evolutionary psychology, but like evolution uh, and how pe epigenetics, how people develop differently based on the environments they grew up in, whether you're, you were Native American or lived in Africa or the Northern region, talks about people up North move their body like this. You see a lot of white people dance like this because uh, up North, there wasn't as many uh, seeds for you to hunt and gather. There weren't trees. Everything was dead. So you had to kill animals. So in order to kill animals, you had to be still all day and then do one giant movement. So I'll link his podcast below as well. Peace out, family. Like, comment, subscribe if this video gave you value. Um, really help, helps my YouTube channel out a ton when you guys hit that subscribe button. Turn that bell button on so you guys get – I'll be going live a lot more. So put turn that bell button on so you guys get notifications. Again, if you guys are interested in the book business blueprint – it is down below. It's only going to go up in, in value as time goes on. We're going to increase the value probably pretty soon. Right now, it's the price is two ninety seven, and that's going to continue 
to increase as we uh, really add some in-depth uh, details on how to scale. So I'm working closely with all the people in there. Shout out Ben. Ben's one of the people in there working closely with them to really make this course uh, more valuable. Right now it's 297. So get your foot in the door, guys. When are you going to get into bulk? Probably never. I like what I'm doing now. Consignment, baby. Uh, but potentially, I, I'd probably do a different type of bulk if I, if I did bulk. Uh, I, I would reconstruct because I've seen people doing bulk, but I'm not like super impressed. I would have to do it a very certain type of way uh, to to make my bank account happy. <laughs> All right, y'all. Peace out, family.